Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome you all to another session in this practitioner's course uh, on analytics, descriptive, prescriptive, predictive analytics. Uh, in the last session, we were talking about machine learning, the intuition behind it, the trips, the traps, the tricks, the intuitive understanding of machine learning. Uh, if you recall, we talked about uh, two important traps. One was when what if the relationship is non-linear in case you are doing multiple regression, which is one of the most common forms of uh, machine learning methods, one of the most common forms of analytics methods or if you talk about the toolkit, it is one of the most used tool in the toolkit. Second, we talked about correlation of error terms. Let us now look at some more traps in regression. So, another very important trap or one of the issues which is often ignored, but is very important is about variance of error terms in regression. Now, this becomes important, this is very, very common in for example, stock data uh, to, to talk in terms of more layman terms, what this variance means, you know what variance is right. So, variance is basically a measure of the, the error, the, the measure of deviation, the square of the standard deviation is what is variance. Now, often what happens is that uh, the error terms. So, for example, if y be your output variable and y cap this is normally this is your model output and this be actual output. So, you do a subtraction of these two terms for all the data points on which you want to run your model. Now, this is the error. Now, typically this error should remain constant, but what often happens is that the error is actually not constant. So, this is something called it is a very uh, it is a tongue twister. This is called hetero C dasticity. So, hetero C dasticity means that your error terms show a variance, the error terms are not correlation. Ideally, when you do a regression, the assumption is that all your error terms, all your errors are same, there is no variation across error. So, the, the, the variation is almost minimal. But in case you have variance in the error terms, this is again an issue and one of the ways you look at it is through something called residual plot. So, what you do is that if you recall in the previous slide, we had this uh, errors. So, you, you plot these errors. So, these are called residuals, which is the difference between what you wanted and what you expected and these be for example, the values that you fitted. So, what you see is that 
though the mean is there if you the mean may be following a straight line, but if you say look at the outer quartile range if you look at the, the extreme say for example, the upper quartile and the lower quartile you see some kind of a funnel shape. Now, this funnel shape basically shows that in reality what is happening is that your errors are increasing. So, over a period of time the previous errors if often uh, if you analyze you will find that the current error is a function of the previous error in a way. So, that is why the errors they, they expand a lot and this happens a lot in uh, uh, stock markets the commodities market because they are uh, they are sentiment driven and when when things are sentiment driven your previous sentiments actually impact your current sentiments and that is why sometimes the markets crash or sometimes there is a what they call runs in the market the beer runs the bull runs that is primarily in a way due to this variance in error terms this heterocidacity. Now, how do you deal with this? There are various ways. So, depending on the kind of plot you see, one of the simple ways to deal with it is you do a transformation of variable. This is one of the simplest way. So, for example, earlier uh, you were trying to plot y. Now, this showed a lot of uh, hetero Sedasticity. Now, instead of y, you plot log y, or depending on how this shape looks like, you can go by something like root y. So, the whole idea is that these extreme points where, where the deviation is highest, you tend to reduce them. So, you try to bring more and more reduction as the values inflate. So, this is one of the common ways. Uh, another uh, huge concern and many a times uh, even these transformations do not work and that is where you have to look beyond a regression based model. The other common issue a very popular issue is that of outliers. Now, outliers are simply values which are not in the normal range of values that you would expect. So, for example, you are doing an analysis of uh, some kind of a score and the scores typically vary between say 30 to 60, but then suddenly you find a score of 90 or you find a score of 120. So, one of the ways is if you recall in your data analysis when we do our box plots. You, you tend to depending upon the amount of conservativeness you want to have in this range you try to eliminate the values which are beyond the upper quartile range or the inner quartile range. So, depending on different levels of conservativeness you want you simply one of the ways is to eliminate the records. So, for example, if you have some records where the scores are really. So, most of the scores are between 30 to 60, but you have one record which is having a 90 value another record which is having a 120 value. So, one of the simple ways is to simply remove, but this often is not recommended there are concerns with this and one of the major concerns is that when you remove this means you have lesser data to build model and this means less accurate model. So, in a way removal is a compromise you do. So, so, think of this, what was the impact of an outlier? Outlier skewed your model, presence of outlier made your model less accurate. So, but when you remove the data point, because the number of data points reduce the model is again less accurate. So, the overall benefit of removing an outlier 
does not tend to be very high and often uh, many a times the regressions are done on data sets which are not very huge and the data sets are not very huge in that case every data point becomes precious. So, removal is not often though it may sound the easiest, but it is not the best uh, of the methods. Uh, there is a whole domain in analytics, uh, the whole field of study which primarily focuses on outlier analysis and how to deal with outliers. Uh, one of the simple ways is instead of doing a removal is instead of removal you cap and cap means you basically say that anything which is above my upper quartile range if y be greater than then y is equal to upper quartile limit. So, if y is greater than this limit, you cap it to upper quartile limit. So, in this way you do not lose the data. However, uh, this, this will work only if you believe that it is a genuine outlier. Many a times the outlier is because you got, you got bad data, it was a printing mistake, it was a data that came from wrong measurement. In those cases, perhaps elimination is the best. So, you have to look into the data, but outlier often and especially when you are dealing with uh, data in the domain of uh, uh, say survey analysis, a lot of this business related, the marketing related data, where some of the data comes from uh, not from purely automated sources. Uh, there are a lot of sources of outliers, the errors that creep in, uh, measurement errors typo errors for example, a very classic case is and this often happens in banks is that uh, when you uh, apply for a loan you have to fill a handheld form and then there is a fellow who then transcribes that whatever you write in your form with pen and paper uh, into uh, machine readable format. So, the transcription at times brings errors. So, those kind of errors you may well better eliminate it. There are other ways of dealing with it. For example, you try to estimate what would be a reasonable uh, way, uh, a reasonable guess and one of the ways to do this guess is for example, you build a model on a data without the outlier, then try to estimate what the parameters look like, create a similarity between uh, the data point which had an outlier versus what uh, the the rest of the model predicts and then try to fit in somewhere. There are a lot of ways, it is a it is a it is a complete field in itself, but uh, the point is this outlier is a trap you need to take care of even before you build the model. Now, very closely related to outlier is another trap, another concern which is high leverage point. So, outlier very high y, the, the predicted or output value. Now, high is something with very high x. So, in simple case of say a bivariate regression, uh, this means uh, x is a value you know for example, if you are plotting your y versus x and this be the typical range and now you have one value which is sitting somewhere here. So, 
rest of say for example, this was the regression line, but this value sitting out here. So, most of the x values are within this range and this is this is kind of an outlier. The outlier is typically on the y, but this is an outlier on x which is called a high leverage point. Uh, there is a maths mathematical reason why it is called a leverage point, but you can intuitively understand that just because of this particular high leverage point, uh, this has the uh, impact this can potentially skew this regression line. So, these values again just like uh, outliers uh, are traps, high leverage points become trap. Uh, it becomes more of a trap when you are dealing with uh, multiple regression. Because in multiple regression, because there are multiple dimensions involved, you may not be able to visualize these high leverage points. Not easy to visualize. Reason being that the value may be within range for each of the different x i's. So, multiple regression means that instead of 1 x you have now x 1, x 2, x 3, x n. Now, for each of these x 1, x 2, x 3, x n the value is within range, but if you look at all of them combined it is somewhere out of sync. Now, this is one of the reasons why it is very difficult to identify high leverage points and yet they are the ones that skew your regression big time. Uh, they calculate something called a a leverage statistic. I will maybe give the formula, but I will not get into details of it, because it becomes uh, too mathy. Uh, it is maybe those of you who are interested they can uh, get into the maths of it, uh, though many softwares will simply calculate it for you. The whole point however, is to keep in mind that you need to take care of uh, high leverage points, you need to eliminate them and uh, you need to before you eliminate them you have to smartly track them. One final pitfall that we face is collinearity. Now, collinearity means your predictors, by predictors I mean your x 1, x 2, if these be the predictors, they are related. So, it means for example, you are trying to build a regression model on uh, let us for example, take the case of sales. Now, you do a regression of sales for multiple variables. So, from your different sources of data you have hundreds of variables. So, one of the variable may be advertisement, then you also have a variable which is radio advertisement, TV advertisement. So, these may be the amount of uh, expenditure made in a year or uh, the amount of uh, uh, people involved or whatever. So, most cases uh, expenditure will be the most popular expenditure will be the most common proxy used so for each of these. So, you have radio advertisement, you have TV advertisement, you have advertisement and then may be a lot of other things. For example, number of competitors etcetera etcetera. Now, if you notice these, this may be the let me be more explicit. So, this is the total advertisement, there is radio advertisement, there is TV advertisement, there may be other forms of advertisement there. 
Now, you may build a model and each of these variables can come out to be significant. However, if you look total advertisement is in a way correlated to your TV advertisement and your radio advertisement, which also means that the TV advertisement and radio advertisement can also be correlated given that the company has a limited budget for advertisement. So, in a sense there can be multiple variables, which are all correlated or in a sense try to predict the same thing in a different way. So, these are this is a tricky situation and yeah one of the simplest way to deal with this is if you find many of these variables are correlated. First of all the issue is how do you find which of the variables are correlated. In this case yes from an intuitive business standpoint you could uh, make a analysis and you can figure out that okay, these variables look seem to be correlated. What if you have uh, a huge number of variables uh, slightly more technical variables or maybe uh, you are doing an analysis where you do not understand the business very properly. So, what do you do? So, one of the methods is correlation matrix. So, in correlation matrix what you do is all the variables x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4 up to x n x n. So, you find out what is the correlation between this. So, this may be 0 0.04, this may be 0 0.5, this may be 0 0.7. 0 0.002. So, you create this matrix, this matrix and then each of those variables where you find high correlation. For example, this seems to be high correlation, this also seems to be reasonably high correlation uh, and then you try to eliminate these variables. You try to you, you decide whether you want to use x 1 or x 3, just one of them not both x 1 and x 3 or you use x 1 and x or x 4, but not both of them. So, in a typical case what you do is you build a model with each of them separately and then you try to see whether the model works or not. However, let me tell you uh, because by the very nature of the maths of uh, multiple regression, you may find out that if you eliminate one of these variables. So, sometimes this variable also gets eliminated and what is left is that some of the other variables become important. So, just removing one collinear variable can also remove the variable with which it was correlated and then uh, the rest of the variables become important. So, this is why you have to uh, take different variables at a time and then uh, do the same analysis. So, one of the ways is to just choose one of these variables. The other approach to deal with this is something called variance inflation factor. I will not get into the maths of it, but uh, uh, it is it's a metric, it is a metric to determine what is the importance of each variable in itself, uh, ignoring rest of the variables uh, which are there in the model. So, typically if your variance inflation matrix is greater than 5, then it is a concern or some people they get liberal and they go up to 10. So, if your V i f is greater than 5 or V i f is greater than 10 depending upon the kind of problem, that is a variable of concern and then you try to deal with it. You at least realize, so this is the first step that you realize that yes there is collinearity there. Now, how do you deal with it? One simple method the easiest and quickest is drop the variable and if you ask me uh, this will work in most of the cases, because you will find that if you remove these variables, because in any case uh, the two variables together were because they were correlated there was collinearity. Uh, they together were also not able to predict too much of the output. So, removing them does not impact uh, too much of uh, your prediction. So, 
one simple way is to simply drop it, the other way is to combine it. So, if you recall in our case we had this total advertisement, we had radio advertisement, we had TV advertisement. So, if you combine these together, these are primarily represented by total advertisement. So, you can choose to go with this one and remove these or you can do a total advertisement minus TV advertisement, which may give a radio advertisement assuming that uh, it may be the case that radio advertisement itself is uh, responsible uh, for a lot of sales that you get. So, in that case this may be another variable. So, either you combine it or you drop it these are the two of the most uh, common methods which are used. Okay. So, we talked about uh, regression, we talked about uh, the concept of uh, machine learning, we, we talked about regression being one of the uh, most uh, important or one of the maybe the, the first uh, areas of problem, first uh, uh, domains where machine learning started being used. Apart from regression uh, there are, so we talked about regression. There are two more areas uh, where uh, machine learning is used. So, this regression and then there is something called classification. So, regression and classification they are typically called supervised learning. They are called supervised learning because uh, when you build the models you, you have a data set where you know the output. Because you know the output in a way you are supervising for each data set you are saying okay, this was my desired output, this was my uh, models output and let me try to tweak the model. So, that my desired output is as close as to my actual output. So, this is in a way trying to supervise it is like uh, teaching a child how to speak uh, and whenever so he says a b c d and if he makes a mistake you supervise you say no this is how you pronounce it this is how you pronounce b so this is the most common form or intuitive form of learning that we do uh, this is supervised learning and then there is another class of model which are called unsupervised learning. Now, this is again supervised learning is what the way we learn from our teachers, this is the way we self learn just by observing, looking into patterns, trying to make sense out of patterns. So, let us look at the next set of methods in machine learning these are classification methods. We will talk of about these in much more detail, but uh, let us have an intuitive grasp of what it is. So, for example, I plot income versus credit card balance and this is a very common problem in the financial sector and let me mark by these d's the plots of different people who defaulted and n b the people who did not default. So, let this be a simple plot, I am just plotting. So, D's, this D means default, N means non default. So, these credit card companies are often worried about uh, which of the fellows will default and uh, not 
pay my monthly due because their uh, profitability operates in a very very uh, dangerous zone i would say between you know trying to uh, for most of the companies trying to incentivize the customer to delay the payments because when you delay the payments uh, you charge interest rate on that and that is a source of money. But if the somebody is delaying too much that may be because he is not even able to pay. So, it is a it is a very very dangerous zone in which they play this game of maximizing the money and hence uh, this is one of the favorite plots that they always try to make and try to make sense out of it. That who are the people who uh, fit different parameters and different uh, variety of parameters who would default and not default. So, I have just taken two parameters out there in reality there may be hundreds of parameters. So, one of my objectives may be to be able to correctly. So, for example, I have one customer who is somewhere say who comes out say here. For example, uh, so let me just give you with a different color. So, this is a new case which came. You do not know this is a new data. So, it is may be a new customer about whom you do not know whether he will default or not default. You want to now decide or make an estimate of whether he will default or not default. So, how do you go about it? So, intuitively if you look at it well it makes sense that roughly it, it looks as if you know this can be clearly partitioned here and people who are here are mostly defaulters, people who are here are non defaulters. But then there are some uh, exceptions out there and then of course, you know there will always be errors in the model you do not want to be 100 percent correct. So, in this case it is simple what if it was much more jumbled. So, these kind of problems are called classification problems. Now, depending upon whether you can easily separate the boundary or not. So, in this case because I had to plot I used only two variables. In reality there may be a large number of variables uh, which are. Uh, so, there the, the number of variables can be huge. If you talk of uh, a typical uh, bank. Uh, which is doing this kind of a default modeling. So, this is often called default modeling, which is just trying to classify people into a 1 0 bracket. 1 means non defaulter, 0 means defaulters or vice versa depending upon the way you build the model. So, the number of parameters uh, for example, for some of the banks are even 35000 parameters. So, these may be parameters uh, like uh, demographic, then account history, then credit bureau, uh, the reference the reference with whom he was made a customer, the history of those people. So, and variety for example, even if you look at account history that may be the minimum balance he keeps, the average balance he keeps, the number of years he has kept, the number of checks that bounced, the number of uh, times he has met his commitment, number of delayed payments. So, there can be huge number of variables, it can run into thousands. Now, depending upon the end that you have depending upon how cleanly separable the data is depending upon a lot of things. There are different types of uh, methods which are used for classification in the banking sector. One of the popular ones is logistic regression and uh, we will talk about it in detail. Then there is k nearest neighbors. There is nave base, which is an extended form of a more generalized LDA model, which are linear discriminant analysis, 
then you have q d s which are basically instead of linear you have quadratic, then you have tree based models, decision trees, then you have support vector machines and of course, these days very popular deep learning or nothing but uh, neural networks. So, this neural networks is a generic set of tools uh, not only used for classification, but all forms of uh, uh, analysis. So, even for regression and even for unsupervised learning they are used, uh, but uh, their use in uh, classification has seen a lot of uh, uptick trends uh, in the recent times. So, this is the classification based models and then we have unsupervised learning. Now, unsupervised learning means uh, see the so far the models that we uh, looked at you know there was always a target variable, there was always something good or bad whether somebody is defaulting or not whether his height is high or low or whether his height is 6 feet or 7 feet, whether the sales will be x or x equal to 1 million or 1.5 million. So, these are all what we talked about supervised learning. Now, we add unsupervised it means there is no you, you are not looking at you are there is no target there is no goal, uh, but you still want to understand the data. So, let me give a very intuitive example and often people fail to understand what unsupervised learning is, but if you look in life I mean in fact, unsupervised learning is the most common way that you learn you take lessons of life and you, you, you try to create patterns out of what you see and observe. Nobody tells you, but that is how we humans are or the entire animal kingdom is designed to act like it is all unsupervised learning. The, the supervised learning is maybe a very small part of uh, what we do. Uh, think of uh, a very simple example, suppose I have two parameters for example, uh, let me talk of uh, spend versus earning. So, you look at data of uh, people, so just two variables there can be multiple variables. Uh, the people the amount of money that they are uh, spending every month versus the amount that they earn. And suppose you get Suppose, this is the kind of uh, data that you look, there are people you know who do earn a lot, but spend little, there are people who earn little, but uh, also spend little, there are people who earn very little, but then they spend a lot, maybe a lot many people these days, and there are people uh, who earn a lot, spend a lot. So, just by looking at this data intuitively you know on uh, just on a two dimensional graph, you, you can sense out that okay, this seems to be like one category of people, this seems to be another category of people, probably these are another category of people, these are another category of people and then these are maybe people in the middle, they are kind of the averages not getting into any specific category or you may want to extend this and include these here and then try to make this as a category. But at least four of the categories are very obvious. Now, this is the way we look at data and try to understand this is what we call looking at uh, forest among trees. So, just looking at these patterns and trying to find out uh, what the data looks like taking 
bringing out meaning out of it this is what is unsupervised learning uh, this is very very popular uh, in marketing so in marketing what they do is uh, when they have to do customer profiling and uh, this is a very very powerful tool used there so for example uh, if if you go into many of these uh, marketing firms if many of these brand based products uh, you know the 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 marketing headquarters of these people you will find a lot of uh, holdings of uh, or, or posters of uh, people you know for example let me just uh, i mean before some fun say can some more insights into the how machine learning etc is used in practitioners way let me let me just draw a poster and you 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 might have seen these posters in many place so here typically there is an image there is name of the fellow there is age gender is obvious from the image then there are his profession and there is some interest statement there is uh, for example uh, often list of his hobbies family details so in a way kind of an entire uh, biography of a person so who he is what is he like and and there can be multiple so this is one poster and there the for the same person there can be n posters and uh, in many companies uh, not only posters they actually have uh, so called biography of a person so so you have actually those uh, booklets which detail about what kind of books he reads what is the kind of food that he loves to eat what does he do when he is free what kind of colleagues he have and all sort of details now uh, many a times if you uh, visit uh, in many shops in many service center etc you will find something similar out there uh, you know at least some of these posters out there so the whole idea the reason they make and this is not something yeah it may there may be companies who are doing it uh, based on their gut feeling but actually the way they have uh, they came out of this was in many cases is through what is called cluster analysis so going back to the the slide so this is nothing but a cluster analysis they looked into multiple parameters we looked into just spend and earning they looked into much more parameters and they found out what these clusters look like now depending upon the from a marketing standpoint depending upon the money dollar 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 this may be dollar dollar okay this is maybe this this is again dollar 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 so depending upon the money they give they find out these clusters they get into a deep dive they try to get more information about it as many parameters that support so in this case uh, uh, we talked about something about collinearity in this case uh, let us look at the same thing in a different way in this case you don't want to eliminate variables which are similar or predict the same thing because you are not predicting anything you want all those parameters which are similar so you may you may do a unsupervised learning with a small set of parameters and then you try to add upon parameters which are strongly correlated and hence you create a kind of a i would say a keyword and 
की पैरामीटर लिस्ट फॉर ईच क्लस्टर ट्राई टू फाइंड आउट इफ देर इज सम सिमिलैरिटी इन दीज सो डिपेंडिंग अपॉन दीज की वर्ड दीज की पैरामीटर लिस्ट फॉर ईच क्लस्टर दे आइडेंटिफाई विच आर द कस्टमर सेगमेंट दे नीड टू टारगेट एंड टू डू दैट दिस इज वेयर देन देयर मार्केटिंग टीम सिट्स बेस्ड अपॉन दिस क्रिएट्स द इमेज ऑफ द फेलो दे लुक एट सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल वन सी ऑफ दीज की वर्ड्स की पैरामीटर्स दिस क्लस्टर दे गेट इन टू डिफरेंट सोर्सेज एंड देन ट्राई टू फाइंड आउट विच आर द एक्चुअल पीपल हु क्लोजली मीट दीज काइंड ऑफ पैरामीटर्स सो they create what is called in marketing lingo persona so this is this is not an actual person so you get these key parameter list etc then based upon this for example you go online go into various sources of data and try to find out actual people who look behave feel like this and then based upon all that collective information you fill in those details now the reason they do this is that now this becomes kind of their guiding light for all their marketing strategies so all their marketing strategies now are based upon uh, these things so often they would divide the team into separate groups each of them is responsible for one particular persona so often you know in many of these very highly brand sensitive uh, products uh, the the marketing managers they try to live with they try to kind of feel this uh, persona apart from biography and uh, bio data and etc god knows they may also create models and they may create 3d images and uh, holograms and stuff like that they can do all kind of crazy stuff i mean like, like if you uh, if you recall that uh, fellow uh, who who played that role of uh, joker in that movie dark knight batman movie so he said to have uh, lived as joker for uh, Six months uh, closed in one room just to live like Joker, read only that stuff and get that Joker inside him, and that is why his performance is rated to be among the um, most extraordinary performances in uh, film history. Though it's unfortunate that uh, that uh, that uh, it took him time and it took a great toll on his uh, life, and uh, uh, he died prematurely. but the point i am telling is that you know they they try to live this and the the the, the source of this thing is what is called cluster analysis and from cluster analysis the entire marketing strategy that flows right from the way the teams are organized to the way they target uh, their customers the kind of product propositions they give the kind of marketing offers the kind of sales incentives they give uh, that is often in many uh, state of the art marketing organizations is driven through this uh, persona based uh, marketing analysis the persona based customer analysis which is nothing but clustering or unsupervised learning apart from clustering uh, another unsupervised learning uh, which you may have done if you have done course on marketing research is pca or nothing but principal component analysis now principal component analysis again uh, for those of you who are uh, comfortable with uh, uh, matrix algebra who have done a course on linear algebra uh, they can get into the uh, maths part of it uh, let me just give you a very high level intuition about what it is what we are trying to do so Uh, what we are trying to do basically is that uh, from a practitioner's perspective is that we have for example as i said in many cases 35000 variables now these so many high number of variables are again a nightmare to deal with how do you deal with so many variables and then there is a whole sort of collinearities there and more variable doesn't mean always more information uh, often more often than not it means more noise so principal component analysis is try to see whether we can summarize some of these variables and then 
have one variable represent these. So, in a way what we are trying to do with principal component analysis is that say x 1, x 2, x n are your variables. So, can there be say for example, I choose x 3, 3 of them variables. Is there a way I can make a one to k. Can I make a linear combination of these variables? That linear combination which is okay, let me try to so which is nothing but a 1 x 1 plus a 2 x 2 plus a 3 x 3 for example, uh, if it is a if I am if there are three variables. So, can I maybe write this expression and then remove these three variables. So, in a way what I am trying to do is to reduce my number of variables. Now, I lose some accuracy in that. So, what principal component analysis does is that it gives you those linear combination of variable along with a metric of how important is this, what kind, what is the kind of loss of information that you have if you combine these variables. So, instead of having a x 1, x 2, x 3 if you have all these three combined obviously. So, this linear because life is not linear. So, there is some loss of information that happens. Uh, so, we will talk about this when we discuss it in slightly detail, but the concept is that can this linear combination replace these x 1, x 2, x 3 and if it can replace then let me try to reduce my number of variables. So, the whole idea is to reduce number of variables. So, I am not doing any regression etcetera, all I am trying to do is trying to find out which of the variables can be combined and in a way it is again looking at patterns. So, for example, uh, and, and often uh, by the way this principal component analysis is again uh, we, we talked about this cluster analysis, uh, we, we talked about this persona, this principal component analysis again used in persona. So, for example, in case the three variables uh, that you found useful were like age, then marital status and income. So, well you can say that if somebody is has a matured age, is married and has high income, he is probably somebody mature or high social status. So, you may say that social this, this these three variables kind of represent social status, not very accurately Maybe if in, apart from income you also have a variable called designation. So, you find he is he has a very high designation. So, you may say that well these three variables I combine them together and I create a new variable called social status. So, this is again very intuitive it is e easy to understand and feel. So, from a marketing perspective from a decision making perspective uh, it gives you a way to get hold of get a business sense get an intuitive sense of uh, what these things are talking. So, often what they do is uh, from an operational standpoint they try to create this principal components and based on this principal component they try to see if I can give some kind of a business meaning to this. So, if you can give a business meaning to it from a practitioner standpoint from a management standpoint uh, uh, that means a lot of my marketing, lot of my strategy, lot of my financing lot of other things I do in the organization to increase my shareholder value that can directly flow from there. So, primarily principal component analysis and uh, cluster analysis they form part of what is called uh, unsupervised learning. So, we looked into uh, classification cluster analysis we have already looked into regression based analysis which covers primarily the most of the way 
machine learning is being uh, used in industry, uh, practitioners use it. In the next class, we will talk about another uh, emerging field, it is not emerging, but it is becoming very popular even in a business domain, which is the reinforcement uh, learning based machine learning tools. We will look about that and then we will also look about uh, some more aspects of doing good machine learning based analysis. Thank you very much.